Hello, folks. I'm going to uh, kick us off. Welcome to Organic Land Management for Playing Fields and Farms. That's the, the subject that we're dealing with. Um, I'm going to use up a few minutes of your time and introduce myself, and then uh, we're going to have a few presenters, and then we're going to basically just have discussion, panel kind of discussion. That's the plan. Um, we have a little bit of PowerPoints prepared so people get to see some pictures. I think images are good for some people, so that's not a bad idea in my opinion. Um, and I do not know, because I wasn't paying attention, if everybody was in the room when Jay uh, just announced, but I'm going to repeat this. I'm supposed to say this at the end of the discussion, but I want to say it now just in case I fail, that right at the end of this, we're all moving to the film screening, which is not in this building. So. This whole thing continues at a movie, uh, dinner and then a movie. You go find dinner and have a movie. But I just want to make sure that people know we're going to the Florence Gold Hall on 55 East 59th Street. So it's my responsibility to make sure you know that. So that said, um, I'm going to uh, try to... Uh, briefly introduce myself. I'm not super brief always, but I will be. Um, and, but the other logistical thing to make sure you're aware of, and I'll introduce our, our uh, participants. The other useful thing for you to know, and I think we might not need it, honestly, but uh, logistically, just so you understand that this is being recorded, and for it to get recorded, things have to be said into this speaker, I mean, into this microphone. And for that reason, I put yellow cards around for people to write their questions down. And who knows how many people are going to show up in the room so that they can be read into the microphone. Um, so we don't have to do it that way. You can walk up and speak into the microphone. But if you want your question recorded, then either someone has to repeat it, which is one option, or you've written it down and we read it, or you come up. So I just want to make sure logistically that everybody's on the same page of understanding that so things aren't captured. Um, Okay, like I said, briefly, I will try to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Cole Auer Bandera, um, and I'm here from Hawaii where I operate a pretty small-scale certified organic farm, have for 18 years. Um, I actually grew up on a farm in Oregon, so I've been farming pretty much my whole life. A few distractions when I went off to graduate school and got a couple master's degrees and things like that, but... Um, that's what happens in life sometimes. Um, but both my children were raised on the farm and are now doing things like working for Google and studying to be architects and things like that. These things carry on. Um, actually, they're both in the same part of California, San Francisco and uh, San Luis Obispo. So that's coincidental, but it's easier for Hawaii than some of the other options. Um, I think. Uh, I served for five years as a small-scale organic producer um, on the National Organic Standards Board for the fact of the matter is that I recognized many years ago that organic standards were not being set for small-scale operators and were not really accessible for people who were farmers. They were really being made for big companies. And for me, that didn't make any sense. And I played that role. I overlapped uh, with uh, Jay Feldman for f four of the years that he was on the uh, NOSB. Um, so I've been in that part of inside the system. It's, you know, a pain, but it has its values, and I, and I tried. Um, I think that the one thing I'll tell you about my farm, besides what I already told you, that it's certified organic, which uh, I wouldn't do anything else anyway, um, is that I'm really different than a lot of my organic friends and neighboring farms is that our farm is, yeah, it's Kona Coffee Farm. We're on the, we're on the west side of the Big Island. It's Kona Coffee, but it's only about 50% Kona Coffee. And I don't even drink coffee. I'm not telling you, that's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you the truth, which is my farm is extraordinarily diverse. I don't just have coffee. I have food that you eat. I don't eat coffee as a food, even if I drink it. And so I, you know, I have avocados, I have macadamia nuts, I have greens, I have lots of different fruits, I have diversity. Because for me, it's not about one crop or one thing or making one system work in one way. It's about the whole ecosystem and the whole picture. And I think that that's critical from my perspe perspective in terms of having a, you know, in, if you're certified organic, you have to come up with an organic systems plan every single year. And it has to get reviewed and approved. And I think that that's 
you know, you have to look at your whole system, and that's really what I do, is not look just at the system of the farm. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Hawaii agricultural realities, but people don't have fences. I'm not looking at boundaries. I'm not looking at those kind of things. I'm looking at the whole ecosystem and my whole behaviors, patterns within how things are affecting me and how I'm affecting things. And I think that that's a critical component of, of being a healthy organic farmer is paying attention to the system. Um, and the only other thing I want to tell you is, even though it was brought up earlier today, and I've heard it before, but I want to make sure it goes in the record and here it's being recorded and I'm glad that um, I am a farmer who has never knowingly drunk Roundup. So, you know, if any farmers want to drink Roundup, they can, but it's not me. So I'm going to um, introduce our speakers today. I, again, knowingly, you never know. Um, and uh, we have a few uh, short PowerPoint presentations, and then we're going to uh, have more of a discussion process with the panel people, um, and or some combination. We're going to take a very short break while the speaker gets moved over here so all the uh, speakers can, can be recorded. Um, so uh, I'm going to let him go as fast as he goes or wants to go, but uh, Chip Osborne, who also, like myself, serves on the Beyond Pesticides Board of Directors, um, is also president of Osborne Organics, uh, based in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Um, it says that he's nationally renowned uh, organic turf grass expert. Um, I am personally not into turf grass, but I totally believe it based on my experience with him. A professional horticulturalist with 35 years of greenhouse production experience. Um, as a wholesale and retail nurseryman. He's uh, a lot of firsthand experience with uh, using pesticides in that context um, within the, the whole landscape industry. And I think that his investigation study of the conventional and organic soil science practices and a lot of hands-on experimentation has really led him as time has passed and where he's at now uh, as a leading expert in uh, organic turf control. So I welcome Chip up here to give us a presentation. So we'll just do some short. I think that the, the idea that I was asked to do was just show pictures to show that this is doable. Um, so I've taken out about half of the slides and just going to run through some quick pictures. But I want to start. I left this in because this is the biggest enemy. This is the biggest thing that we struggle with. So no matter what it is in the landscape, what I'm trying to manage, this is the thing that I have to overcome. Uh, and this isn't the product side of it. You know, this is nothing to do. This is the cultural side of it. So, uh, you know, we heard that a handful of soil is half air, water, and then the other half is solid matter made up of, of some uh, percentage, relative percentages of mineral and organic matter, mineral particulates and organic matter. So what happens with repeated downward pressure, uh, those air pockets known as pore spaces get eliminated, get squeezed out of there, and we now have particle touching particle. And uh, those that, that environment goes from aerobic in the presence of oxygen to anaerobic in the absence of oxygen. So we have this kind of a situation here, and we look at how these trails are formed. Uh, not likely that anybody went in the bottom right and cut that out of that fern path, but it's probably a deer path or a human walk path that after repeated uh, movement through there, compacted the soil so that that plant could no longer uh, survive. Same thing here, and then it leads us to that situation there. And any of you that have had children or grandchildren in uh, sports have seen that uh, more often than not in a municipality because many times Municipalities don't have the budget or the know-how to get rid of it. The herbicides were used on uh, this property, not one of my properties, but you can see in the back of that soccer goal that we have some clover in there. So herbicides have been used. They certainly didn't grow grass. They certainly didn't improve the system. They just simply took that legume out of the system. Then we have an athletic field that looks like that. So then we ask that question, are pesticides the difference? Now you look at the use of these properties seven days a week, seven to eight hours a day, and varsity home games only, a small handful of events. So now we can clearly see that soil density makes the difference here. It's not whether or not we have an herbicide application. Roots do not grow in soil. 
They grow in those pore spaces or air pockets between the soil particles. So that diagram on the left shows a long fibrous root going through a soil that has good structure, exhibits good pore space, ample oxygen. We have good gas exchange, oxygen cycling in, carbon dioxide uh, cycling out, and we have a healthy soil system and then a healthy plant. On the right-hand side, we're uh, compacted. We do not have the gas exchange. We have oxygen simply bouncing off the surface, carbon dioxide as given off by that uh, root of the plant and the microbial communities trapped down there and we have an anaerobic situation. Uh, as we've heard from Paul this morning, when you get anaerobes growing, we have a bad, we have a bad situation uh, from the microbial complex. So what aeration does is takes that slide on the right and turns it back into the one on the left. But it doesn't happen alone. It's not just the mechanical process of aeration. It is fundamental, fundamentally the healthy development of the microbial community, which is, which is responsible in the largest way for maintaining good soil structure. So simply running a mechanical aerator over there without paying attention to the biological complex is really not going to get you where you want to go. Uh, plants are not much different than we are. So you can, the uh, minute you take that oxygen away from that root zone, uh, of, the, uh, of the plant or the uh, microbial community, we're in trouble. So we have that kind of a situation there. There's no amount of inputs, whether it's an herbicide, irrigation, fertilizer, grass seed, none of it's going to have a lasting effect until we reverse compaction. So we can spend all the money in the world and we can't make a change there until we begin to address culturally what is happening from the density and the anaerobic condition in that soil. So compaction directly relates to weeds, drought intolerance, and lower energy reserves uh, in, in grass plants on an athletic field. Uh, this is just simply a diagram. This is cool season grasses, how they grow spring and fall. But what this is telling us, and this is courtesy of uh, Frank Rossi, Dr. Rossi Cornell, um, that uh, in the uh, middle of the summer, when things are hot in the Northeast, we have a greater consumption of energy than production. If we add compaction on top of that, uh, soil, increased soil density conducts heat deeper and faster than low density soil. So as you increase compaction, that heat transfer happens more rapidly and deeper. And uh, if you are growing a cool season turf grass, you exceed the desirable range for uh, soil temperatures. So root mass goes down, water infiltration goes down, drought tolerance goes down, energy reserves go down, weed populations go up, disease goes up, and if it's an athletic field, sports injuries goes up because the resiliency of the field, and resiliency is a technical term in sports turf that describes what happens when an athlete hits that surface and how much shock that surface can, uh, can um, absorb. So maintaining quality turf is much easier in loose soil, particularly in the sports field. So again, turf grass roots do not grow in soil. They grow in those air pockets. So if we're managing an athletic field with the heavy use and, and that happens in almost every municipality around the country, there's, 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 no municipality in the country has enough acreage of athletic fields to take fields out of play and let them rest uh, for a period of time to sort of rejuvenate and, uh, and return to good conditions. So we're doing this so, sort of as things are happening. Uh, we've talked about a systems approach, soils. Penn State gave me these two slides. Uh, conventionally, we've been taught to look at soil like that. Uh, and they now propose that it's all integrated. We can't just separate that. Let me skip right through to soil testing. Uh, we know it's soil, we, we, we know soil testing, we, we talk about soil testing, T reference, reference that. Uh, we test for soil structure, texture, particle size analysis to determine what we are dealing with in the terms of sand, silts, and clays. Uh, we have soil tests that we can run for soil chemistry that tells us the macro micronutrients, the pH of the soil, cation exchange capacity, and the organic matter fraction. 
And then we also have those soil tests that uh, Paul uh, Wagner runs at Soil Food Web, Food Web that give us the biological analysis of the soil. So here is a sample from a uh, little bright in here, but uh, this is a soil from um, Pepperdine University in Malibu uh, on their soccer field where I've been working for two years and will continue to work for the next three years to transition the entire campus to organic management. And they started with the soccer field, which is an NCAA uh, Division I competition field uh, and probably the most significant field on the West Coast. Uh, and this is an example of an anaerobic soil. When we pulled this soil out there, uh, their, their grounds manager that took this said, it smells like the sewer. And that's what it was. We have an anaerobic black layer down there because it's a sand-based field. It's 82% sand. And all they've been doing is pumping synthetic soluble, water-soluble nitrogen to it for the five years since it was built. And they've created this situation where this is a monoculture of Kentucky bluegrass cut to one inch, but as soon as those roots get down there and get into that soluble salt layer, they just burn right up. And so that's what's happened there. Uh, there is that soil there. That doesn't look like a very healthy soil. So that is you know, very different coming into a project like this uh, as opposed to if, 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 if in the construction phase of it, if they had introduced uh, the concept of natural st strategies pre-construction, we wouldn't be dealing with this now. So this is the kind of a thing that can't be identified without profiling, without going down, without looking at the rhizosphere. Um, here's the healthy, healthy, foot, healthy soil. This is the baseball field just below. Entirely different field. Um, still had some of the same things going on there, but it was a better soil because there was some native soil in there. It wasn't just an engineered root zone. Uh, here is just shows what we can do with, um, with, uh, with, with grass in the Northeast. So this is a picture in my town of Marble Head, Massachusetts. You can see that hillside. Uh, that's what it looked like last week. But we had put those white covers, which are called turf blankets, on there where we can maintain a 50 degree uh, temperature under those blankets all winter long and extend the growing season. So those blankets were pulled off last Wednesday, and that's what I had. Uh, on close up, there it is. This has been organic since 2001. So I don't have any weed pressures, even with grass growing all winter long. So they tell me that you can't do this in California. You can't do this on Maui. You can't do this in Florida because you guys have winter up there that kills everything and makes it all you know, reset the clock in the springtime. As you can see, that's been growing for 365 days straight. Uh, here is the Pepperdine University uh, baseball field. Uh, the first organic program was written for that last week. It will be, begin to be implemented next week. Uh, and where we'll be, this is the second field. Uh, here's the one, is one of the handful of weeds in 85,000 square feet. Uh, anybody recognize that? That is broadleaf plantain, but you probably don't recognize it because this is Bermuda grass that's cut to uh, three quarters of an inch. So it takes on a different appearance, but that is the, that the, that's the, the kind of weed pressure. Now, this has been treated chemically, so now we're transitioning this from Speed Zone, which is a three-way chemical cocktail with 2,4-D, one of the ingredients. This is being transitioned beginning two weeks from now and will begin to be 100% organic management, but there is a transition period. Uh, Pepperdine Soccer Field, though that's not weed there. That is a grass called Poa annua, annual bluegrass. They don't worry about that because as soon as the warm weather comes, that goes away. So there are products that could be used to mitigate that, but that's not a concern. So that is the accepting of the genetic diversity and knowing that it doesn't interfere with the um, integrity of the field. Here's my one patch of weeds in 88,000 square feet. A little bit of clover got in there. So if you walk the 88,000 square feet, that's all you're going to see. So we've been working on this for two years and transitioning it bit by bit by bit, and now it is, uh, as of now, 100% organic, and there it is. That's what it looked like two weeks ago. Uh, so Malibu is coming out of its winter, coming into its spring, which uh, uh, late winter, early spring out there is the perfect time for Kentucky bluegrass. The idea that you can manage at that level, and that's what's required of an NCAA. Right or wrong, that's what's required. So that's the expectation. I'm the first to admit there's too much grass in the world, and a whole lot of it should go away. 
But in this case, it's not going to go away, and it's not going to be tolerated, and this field would not qualify under those standards for NCAA if it exhibited, you know, a large, a large diversity of plant material in there. That's just not going to happen. So sometimes, do I, do, I, do I agree that I want a monoculture of Kentucky bluegrass? Not necessarily. But do I have to, at times, compromise what I may think in order to provide an expectation that is required? Because if I don't deliver it like that, then I'm gone, and the Trimec speed zone comes back, and that's just what's going to happen. Uh, and then what's happened is uh, we've gone through the rest of the campus. They were so happy with the way that saga field went. Now we're working with redwood trees, and here's a ficus tree. They built a new athletic center, and they chopped off 35% uh, of the root zone of this tree that was 85 years old. And it immediately went into the shock that you would expect. So they brought in their consultant that preceded me, and it was salt-based salt fertilizer. We've got to put urea in there. We have to do this. We have to do that. And they put uh, one application of urea before they gave the tree to me, and it got worse. So then I, they, they said, well, do you want to take a stab at it? And I said, sure. I didn't have the ability to brew compost tea there at the time. I still don't. Next year, I hope to have. So what did we do? We did the next best thing. We scraped off all the wood mulch that they had, brought in a high-quality compost, top-dressed it. We actually put the wood mulch back on top of it. I didn't want to, but that was the aesthetic that was required. And now we have all of that breaking out on that wood, and that, that happened in nine months. Just by getting that back into the system and returning to biological. Uh, here's just an example of a biologically active lawn. I've got Paul's soil tests. Uh, this is Christmas Day in uh, northern Massachusetts. Uh, the fact that the microbes were still active, still resilient at that time of the year, and providing that kind of a look. And here's the lawn that I was on uh, Monday, Tuesday, before I came down here. And this is another one of my properties. Uh, and this is when the, 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 lawn, the chem lawn guys are going to be out putting down soluble nitrogen on that lawn to get quick green up. But this is a lawn that has just completed two years of organic transition, 100% organic, zero weed populations. We've uh, mitigated fungal disease through improving the biomass. Uh, we've got this, and now the, this was Kentucky bluegrass mown at the appropriate height of three inches. And now the homeowner announced that uh, he probably has way too much money to, uh, to spend, but he just decided that he wanted this 58,000 square feet of bluegrass to look like Fenway Park. So we went out and bought a $20,000 real lawnmower, and we will be cutting this beginning in three weeks at one and three eighths inches. So we can give him that look. That wasn't my suggestion. That was his demand. So that's what happened. So I get these demands. You have to do this. And if I don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. So now that's my challenge, to, to take Kentucky bluegrass monoculture, chop it down to an inch and three-eighths, and produce an organic, weed-free lawn. So, you know, it remains to be seen. We've put together a program where we're moving into a, a new era, you know, a new area for him, but he has this aesthetic that's in his mind. And that simply is the way it is. So sometimes we do what we want to do. Sometimes we do what we think is the right thing to do. And sometimes we have to do things even though we may not necessarily agree with it. So that's it for me, Cole Howard.